do you think would happen if a person didn't have renunciation, didn't have this attitude in their mind, and they took initiation and tried to do tantric practice? Would that be a problem? Huh? <laughs> Why? Because it contradicts, you know, the whole uh, the whole thing. You have to practice. You have to know what you're going towards. You have to renounce what you have to renounce, and then go to tantra. There are steps that you must take before, you know. Otherwise, you will never get where you want to get. <laughs> Logic. I would say that uh, whatever that maybe probably in Tantra, just like in meditation, that without renunciation, every sort of uh, experience that uh, that would uh, be perceived as pleasant or as um, spiritual, then we gain attachment to it. And then uh, it would be then the result be another expression sorrow and, and, and more suffer. And, uh, that would be, uh, I think, not different also than the, the meditation uh, or clinging to uh, spiritual uh, achievements and still be a part of that cycle. Yeah, I think that's quite possible because you know, <coughs> through practicing Tantra it's possible mm -hmm. to have some really pleasant, blissful, wonderful, even, you know, superhuman <laughs> experiences. <clears throat> if you didn't have a clear idea of why you're doing this practice, where you're trying to get to, then you could easily get attached and your ego could get quite big as well. You know, you could get all puffed up and think, wow, you know, what a great, you know, yogi I am. And, you know. <laughs> um, this happens, it seems, you know, some things I've heard and and um, yeah, so um, so that's why it's really important to have an understanding of why we practice tantra, where we're going with this practice. It's not just about having nice experiences in this life, or enhancing your sex life, or having more intimate relationships, which is what many people think. You know, that's what tantra is all about. Um, just enjoying your 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 relationships more and just having pleasure in this life alone. And that's not the Buddhist view. That's not the Buddhist reason for practicing Tantra. So it's a kind of misuse, kind of um, abuse and misuse of, of Tantra for, for those purposes. Okay, so moving on. Um, the second of the three principal aspects of the path is bodhicitta. That is the... Um, the mind of enlightenment, meaning the wish or aspiration to become a Buddha, fully enlightened being, in order to help all living beings. So your real goal, in fact, your real goal is helping others. You see all the suffering of all the beings in the world, and you feel this great compassion wishing them to be free of suffering, wishing them to be happy, wishing them to get out of samsara. So it's actually said that you have to have renunciation as the basis for bodhicitta. Because if you skip over renunciation and you just try to generate bodhicitta, then your compassion for others will not be complete. You might see, oh yeah, they get, they're, they're hungry and they're, you know, homeless and sick and, and so on, you might see just superficial kinds of suffering and want to relieve those. But if you don't understand the, the deep causes of suffering, delusions and karma that are in their minds and that keep them stuck in samsara over and over and over and over again, then your bodhicitta will not be complete. So for bodhicitta to be complete, you have to have a good understanding of the whole situation of samsara, cyclic existence, which is like a prison. You know? So we're all, there's lots of beings in this prison. And uh, with bodhicitta, you think, 
I want to get myself out so that I can rescue all the others, so that I can get all the others out as well. But if I can't even get myself out, then how can I get others out? <laughs> so your real goal is helping others, freeing others from the prison of samsara, cyclic existence. But you realize you've got to work on yourself. You've got to develop yourself, your own mind, your own abilities, so that you can help others. So anyway, you know Bodhicitta because that was module number 11 or 10 or something like that. So, so you spend a whole module looking at that. And um, anyway, it's um, an essential basis for the practice of Tantra because Tantra is, pract is I mean, when the Buddha taught Tantra, it was taught as a method for the attainment of Buddhahood. That's the whole purpose of Tantra. It's a practice for attaining Buddhahood, enlightenment, full enlightenment. And so the motivation you have for practicing Tantra should be in line with that. You know, it should be to become a Buddha, to be able to benefit all living beings. <clears throat> so there's various methods for Developing bodhicitta. Which one did you do in, in the module? Was it the seven point mind training? Um, seven point cause and effect. All sentient beings have been our mothers and they've been kind and so on and so forth. Yeah. So that's one of the main methods for developing bodhicitta. There's another one, I don't know if this was mentioned, that has five steps. And it's called equalizing and exchanging oneself and others. Yeah, yeah, we did that. You did that one too? You know it all. You know it all. I did? Rita. Uh, yeah, okay, so you did the both. You did both. You know it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, again, it's not enough. <laughs> it's not enough just to know the methods, but we need to meditate on them again and again and yeah, until you know the real bodhicitta yeah, is um, when it, when that thought or that feeling, that attitude just arises spontaneously without having to think about, oh, sentient beings are suffering, and oh, I want to help them, and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but just, poof. as soon as you see somebody who's suffering, or you hear about somebody who's suffering, or you think about somebody who's suffering, immediately poof, comes this natural, spontaneous wish to become enlightened, to help that sentient being and everybody else as well. So when bodhicitta comes up in that way, that's what that's when you become a bodhisattva. That's the meaning of a bodhisattva. Bodhisattva is someone in whom bodhicitta just arises naturally and spontaneously. They say in the same way that the thought of food comes up if you're really hungry. If you haven't eaten for a couple of hours and your stomach is growling, you don't have to think about food. You don't have to think, well, what should I do? Hmm. You know, thoughts of food will just come up in your mind. Okay naturally spontaneously right so in the same way when the thought of when the thought of bodhicitta just comes up naturally and spontaneously in our mind by thinking of sentient beings that that's the point at which you are a bodhisattva so they say we need to keep meditating on the methods for developing bodhicitta trying to make our minds familiar with these again and again until we get to that point and then in the sutra tradition, uh, the way to actually become a Buddha is mainly by practicing the six perfections. So for the sutrayana, the paramitayana, that first division of Mahayana, that's what, we'll, that's what a bodhisattva would do to become enlightened. They practice generosity and ethics and patience, joyous effort, concentration and wisdom. Those are the main practices they do for a long time. They say in the Paramitayana, it can take at least three countless great eons. 
before you become enlightened. It's a long time. Well, that's what the Buddha did. Our Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, he spent three countless great eons. Yes. Eon. 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 You know Eon? E-O-N. Don't ask me how long that is. It will scare you. <laughs> I don't even remember, but it's a long time. <laughs> so it's a really long time. But with Tantra, <laughs> the shortest amount of time is one life. But that's rare. Hmm? A sale. A sale? It's like... <laughs> a discount. Oh, yeah. Big discount. <laughs> but that's very special. Only a few manage to do that. But anyway, the point is that you can shorten the amount of time for becoming enlightened. And then, number three is the correct view of emptiness. So this is also a very important basis for tantric practice because when you do tantric practice it's mainly like if you take an initiation um, not always but many times you the lama will ask you to do a practice every day and a tantric practice the, the full form of a tantric practice is called a sadhana <clears throat> sadhana, which literally means method for accomplishment. And a sadhana is a practice that involves, it has different steps to it. Taking refuge. Huh? Sadhana is a method for? Accomplishment or accomplishing. It's a method. That's just a literal translation of the word sadhana. So in a sadhana, there are different parts. Usually it starts with taking refuge generating bodhicitta, and then maybe some practices for purification, accumulation of merit. Then, towards the beginning of the practice, um, there's a meditation on emptiness. You meditate on emptiness. Ideally, <laughs> you already understand emptiness. You've already got a good understanding of it, so you, you can just bring to mind your understanding of emptiness and contemplate how yourself and everyone else and everything else, whatever exists, is all empty of inherent existence. So you just let go of your usual wrong way of seeing things. You let all that dissolve into emptiness. And then it's out of emptiness that you begin the practice of visualization. Because a sadhana involves visualization of, of uh, divine figures, deities, a mandala, and so on and so forth. So it, it's all supposed to be done on the basis of an understanding of emptiness. So if you don't have an understanding of emptiness, um, then you know your practice isn't really correct. Um, so yeah. So, of course, it's not easy to get an understanding of emptiness, but we have to at least try by learning as much as we can and meditating on it, studying it, discussing with others, asking questions about it until we get some kind of understanding of what emptiness is and then meditate on it so that we deepen our understanding and so on. So that was the last module we did, right? The module number. <laughs> so you know it all now. <laughs> you understand. You know emptiness. <laughs> yeah. Actually, a really good book. Um, I don't know if anyone has a copy of it, but it's called Introduction to Tantra by Lama Yeshi. Anyone have a copy of that? Yeah, yeah, okay. So it's, it's quite relatively simple and straightforward. Lama Yeshi's way of teaching was always very practical and very, you know, down to earth. So, the first part of the book, he explains the, these three um, principal aspects of the path. And um, the terms that he uses in that book are a little different than the, a little bit different. Um, the term he uses for renunciation is emerging, meaning, you know, we're trying to emerge from samsara. 
emerge from this unsatisfactory situation that we are in, where we have all this suffering and confusion and karma and delusion. So we, we need to emerge from that, to get out of that. For bodhicitta, he uses the term opening, opening our heart. This is how he explains bodhicitta, opening up our heart, expanding our heart um, beyond being obsessed with me, 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 being self-centered and putting ourselves first, putting ourselves at the center of the universe, but opening up. And that's actually a really good way to start working on bodhicitta, just trying to be more aware of others, more concerned about others, understanding that others want happiness just as we do. Why not care about them? Why, not, why care only about me? And also, caring about others is so much more satisfying. <laughs> it makes your life so much more meaningful than being obsessed about me, 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 me all the time. So it's so narrow and limited and so much suffering as well. You make so much suffering for yourself by being concerned so much about me, 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 me. Just today, I was having lunch with some friends, and we were talking about driving in Israel. <laughs> this, is a good, this is a good opportunity where you can work on thinking of others. Because she mentioned, you know, how some people have this habit, like if you uh, are going to turn a corner, or you're in a lane to turn, and some people come along at the last minute and want to go right in front of you, right? Yeah, you know that one? <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, it happened to you? <laughs> well, it happened to me. You never, no, no, no. <laughs> anyway, she said she used to get really annoyed about that. And, um, and, you know, but that just makes your mind up tight and upset and unhappy. So now what she does is she slows down and lets the person go in. And, and I've done that too. When I first started driving, that was happening. I'd say, why are you doing that? You know, you shouldn't be doing it. You should get in line like everybody else. So I also realized that just makes your mind unhappy and agitated, right? Mm -hmm. So you put yourself into a negative state of mind by being unhappy about these people. So on the other hand, if you, I mean, if, of course, if you're super rushed, if you're late for your work, late for an appointment, maybe you, do need to go you first. Are late all the time. <laughs> well, I usually think, I, I, I got time. Maybe this guy needs to get to work before me. So I let them go in. And it's so much nicer if you do that. Yeah? Just let him, let him have his way. So that's just one example, you know, in our daily life where we can be on the lookout for others and instead of kind of fighting with them, competing with them, you know, <laughs> which probably won't make you feel any better, you know, just let them, let them go, let them have their way, be nice to them. So there's opportunities just in our daily life where we can be attentive to other people around us. And even if they're behaving in a rude way or in a not so nice way, it's okay, we can, you know, be kind to them. Fighting with them, competing with them, probably won't help. On the other hand, if you treat them with kindness, that might have some effect on them. That might, maybe not immediately, but it might make them think, well, oh, a person treated me this way, maybe I can do the same. Because I do say that kindness is contagious. Have you heard that? When one person does an act of kindness, it can motivate others or influence others to do acts of kindness. And then, then, then when they do acts of kindness, even more people will notice and get. So it spreads. So one act of kindness can be very powerful. In fact, I have to tell you this story because I was so moved by it. I read an article a few days ago in a Buddhist magazine about this guy, American guy, and uh, he came, his family background was sort of troubled and so he, he became a bully when he was in school. He started bullying other kids and he said he became addicted to adrenaline because 
if he could scare another child, make another child frightened or upset or angry, he would get off on that. He would get some charge from that. So he kept doing that more and more and more. And then as he got older, he got into a white supremacy group. He got into white white supremacy. You know what that is? Kind of neo-Nazi, but they're against yeah. everybody. You know, if you don't have lily white skin, if you're black or brown or Jewish or whatever, you know, that's you're not right. good enough. Huh? No, that's right. There's different groups. Anyway, he, that's what he called it, white supremacy. So, and skinhead, and I don't know. Anyway, he started a music group, and they were playing that kind of music. I didn't even know there was such a music, but anyway, <laughs> that's what they were doing. And then he started a gang, a white supremacy gang, and they were going out and be beating up other people and getting into fights and so on. So his whole life was racist and hateful and violent and aggressive and divisive, you know, like that. Um, but there were a few things that happened to him, a few acts of kindness that kind of touched him. One example was he was in a McDonald's restaurant and uh, the cashier was a black woman and she looked at his hands. He had on his right finger, no, middle finger, he had a swastika. So he would use that, you know, to do that dirty sign. <laughs> so she saw that on his, on his hand and she said to him, I know you're really not like that. I know you're better than that. Something like that, you know. So she, she spoke to him in a kind and compassionate way. And it was like, it was such a shock for him. He just ran out of there and never came back. It, it, it kind of touched something in him, but he couldn't deal with it. He's used to getting hatred. He's used to getting, you know, negative feedback. And that would feed him, it would feed his own hatred. So there were a few things like that that happened, but then the real change happened when he became a father. He wanted to have a child, so he had this little girl. And then he started thinking, this path that he was on, he, he would, there was a good chance he'd either end up in prison or dead. And what about his little girl? What would that do to her? So that started him thinking. But then the real change happened one day when his little girl was at um, preschool and he saw her playing with other children who had black skin, brown skin, and he started thinking, they're all just kids. They all came out of their parents, their mothers and fathers. So probably all of these things building up over time, you know, that was the last straw. He changed his life. <laughs> He stopped his, you know, neo-Nazi white supremacy stuff and started getting a normal job and doing normal things. But then, after that, he said, when his daughter was about 10 years old, she started reading books by the Dalai Lama. And then he started reading them, too. And then he went to a Buddhist group in his town and started doing meditation. So it's like he went 180 degrees, right? from, you know, racist, hateful, violent, you know, that kind of attitude to being a Buddhist and getting involved with other things, also helping people come together rather than devising, dividing. So I just thought it was such an inspiring story just to show how people can change. Yeah? So if you meet somebody or hear somebody who's like him, <laughs> There's always a possibility that they will change. And it also shows that acts of kindness, even if the person doesn't immediately respond and change and transform themselves, it can still make an impression on them, like little drops that will, you know, eventually bring about some change. <clears throat> so do acts of kindness as much as you can. <laughs> And that'll help you to be happier and feel better. It'll help others and help you to have more bodhicitta. Oh yeah, so we were talking about emptiness. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Emptiness, we also need to have some understanding of that. And um, 
I guess a simple way, Lama Yeshi would use, use this term concrete view, which is kind of a nice expression about the way we see things. This is, we see things as if they exist in a very concrete way. There's a real concrete I over here. I exist, I'm real. And then others, both people we like, people we don't like, and everybody else, they also seem to exist in a very real, concrete way. There's a real person over there, a real friend, a real enemy, a real stranger. And then the things as well that we see, things that are beautiful and attractive, things that are ugly and disgusting, they also seem to exist in a very real and concrete way. You know, really beautiful, really awful, disgusting, and so on. <laughs> so if we can recognize... So, so this way of seeing things as, as concrete um, supports our disturbing emotions. It supports our attachment to I and our self, you know, self-centeredness, ego-centeredness, and it also supports our attachment to the nice people and the beautiful things. It supports our aversion and our hatred for the not nice people and the ugly things. And it's, so this whole situation is based on not seeing things realistically because things don't exist in such a concrete way as they appear. So if, if we just question, you know, just take a look at how things appear to our mind and ask ourselves, is it really like that? Is that person really so horrible from their own side, independently, inherently? <coughs> so I think we looked last time in the last um, module about dependence, dependent arising, and how we can think about the different ways that things are dependent and not independent. So things are dependent on causes and conditions. So that person came into existence from causes and conditions, their mother and their father, all the milk they drank when they were a baby that made them bigger and bigger and bigger, and all the other food they've eaten in their life that made them bigger and bigger and bigger, all the air they breathe and so on, and all the parts of their body, all the cells and molecules and atoms that make up their body. So they exist dependent on all those things. If those things didn't exist, that person wouldn't exist. That person wouldn't be there. They're also dependent on our mind, dependent on labeling. You know, we label that person as bad, horrible, ugly, disgusting, frightening. But somebody else has a different label. You know, for that person's mother, for example, they're my dear child. Oh, they're so wonderful. They're so sweet. They're so good. <laughs> or their wife, or their husband, or their kids, or their dog, or whatever. Okay, so there are other people who give a different label to that person. Right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I'm just rushing through this quickly. But it's really helpful to kind of take things apart in this way. To look at the, the ways in which an object, a person, or another kind of object, is dependent on other things for their existence. They don't exist independently. And if you do this kind of contemplation, I really recommend it, especially if you're feeling very emotional, like strong aversion or dislike or anger or fear or whatever towards somebody or strong attachment, you know, just going, going crazy, obsessed with somebody or something. It's really good to think about how that person or object exists dependently depending on so many other things, so many other factors. Because the effect that this has, for me anyway, it softens. The, th the object will appear more soft, more transparent, not so solid and concrete. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Yeah. Try it. you got to try it. <laughs> right? Things don't seem as solid and concrete as they did before. There's more flexibility, more fluidity, more possibility for different ways of thinking, different ways of acting and feeling and relating. 
So this isn't a full understanding of emptiness, but it's a softening of the concrete view. And if your concrete view of things gets softened, that really helps to reduce the strong, disturbing emotions that can come up in our minds sometimes. So this is, I think, a good way, a practical way of um, approaching an understanding of emptiness. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a meditation on this subject? Well, maybe we could do one. Maybe um, after the next break, at the, at the start of the next, the last session, we could do a meditation on that. Yeah. So, Tantra practice is built on top of the Lam Rim, stages of the path. In particular, these three principal aspects of the path. So, <clears throat> it's, it's important to continue to study and reflect and increase one's understanding, one's experience of these three principal aspects of the path. So, even after taking an initiation and starting to do tantric practice, you don't just leave behind the Lam Rim, the three principles of the path, right? You don't just say, okay, I've done that. I don't need to do that anymore. <laughs> we need to keep working on these. Because yeah, if these are not well established in our mind, and even if we're doing tantric sadhanas and reciting mantras and visualizing deities and so on, it's not going to work. It, doesn't, it won't be the cause for enlightenment. And it might be the cause for more suffering. Yeah, we might have attachment, like we were talking before, you know thinking, wow, I'm such a great tantric yogi and I know all this and I'm doing all that and I've had so many initiations and it doesn't know. So you, you, your, your ego could get even bigger than before <laughs> and your delusions could get even worse than before. So there's dangers actually, dangers if we don't have a good solid basis in these three. Do you want to ask a question? Yeah. Said about that the uh, tantra is uh, leaning on the uh, lam rim, um, and, and the lam rim is 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 is, uh, is like the, the, the gradual uh, approach, uh, which is more uh, in the uh, man mudra school, right? <coughs> or I mean, because in dzogchen it would be different. Like so, it won't be lam rim in the dzogchen, right? And they still practice tantra. <coughs> So well, what would that be based on? Like, what, what would be... I mean, I haven't had much experience with Dzogchen, <coughs> but my understanding is that um, they talk about nine yanas, yeah? And Dzogchen is actually the very top. And you should, ideally, um, work your way through all the nine yanas. So... Um, it's, it's equivalent to the Lam Rim because the first two yanas, the here and solitary realizer yanas, and that's related to renunciation, you know, the need to get ourselves out of samsara, out of, out of our karma and delusions. And then there's the bodhisattva yana, which is the bodhicitta, and so on. So there is a gradual approach, although I'm not sure if all teachers who teach Dzogchen in, in the world now are teaching it in that way. It seems sometimes they just jump right into the ninth, <laughs> the ninth yana without teaching the basis. Is that, I don't know. Yeah, but if you look at the traditional teachings, the traditional presentation, it's the highest built on these other levels. So, and also you're supposed to do a lot of preliminary practices like, you know, pur for purification and so on and so forth. So, and I think it's the same with Mahamudra. Mahamudra is also a very kind of advanced level of, of practice. And before doing Mahamudra, you're supposed to do a number of preliminary um, practices. So, I mean, I think, you know, the terminology may be somewhat different, but I think if you look carefully, you will find 
the same basic elements are there. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's do a little bit more. Um, and then we'll have another break. <laughs> okay, so um, now letter D. Uh, how uh, Vajrayana or Tantra is different from Paramitiana. So again, Paramitiana is um, one type of, of Mahayana practice for the attainment of enlightenment, Buddhahood. And then Vajrayana or Tantra is another one. So in what ways are they different? So Vajrayana contains practices for <clears throat> Number one, developing wisdom and method in one consciousness. So, do you know what wisdom and method are? Do you remember? Emptiness and decompression. Yeah, so that's a simple, that's a simple way of talking about it. Um, wisdom refers to the wisdom understanding emptiness. Method refers to compassion, bodhicitta. It can also refer to the first five perfections. Um, giving, ethics, and so forth. See, so these are the main practices um, a bodhisattva must do in order to reach enlightenment. So that's true for Vajrayana as well. So somebody who's following the Vajrayana path also needs to practice the six perfections. So you don't just skip over those, avoid those. They, they are um, part of it as well. So in, that, in general then, wisdom and method are, compa are wis uh, wisdom realizing emptiness and compassion, and they are compared to the two wings of a bird. So we need, a bodhisattva needs both of these <laughs> to be able to fly to enlightenment. Um, so, you find wisdom and method both in the Paramitayana path and the Vajrayana path. But the way in which they are practiced is somewhat different. It's a little complicated, but... So, once the, the sixth perfection is part of the method? The first five, the first five perfections are method, and the sixth perfection is the perfection of oh, wisdom. Okay. So you can say that method, yeah, the, the six perfections cover method and wisdom. Okay. So in the Paramita path, Paramitayana path, the way in which you practice method and wisdom is alternatively, alternating, <laughs> sorry, you alternate them, meaning that at certain times, you are practicing method, you are working in the world, for example, helping sentient beings with compassion, practicing generosity, you know, ethics, and so on. So you're actively engaged in developing bodhicitta and practicing bodhicitta. And then at other times, you work on wisdom. So that really requires you know, working on your own, uh, studying to understand emptiness, meditating in order to get a realization of emptiness. So it's more internal. You're more, you know, on your own trying to develop the wisdom that understands emptiness. And um, the process of developing the wisdom of understanding emptiness, you first develop a conceptual understanding, conceptual or intellectual understanding of emptiness. And then, that, and that's, you know, quite an important achievement, quite a high achievement, but one needs to go beyond that and reach what's called a direct realization of emptiness. Direct means non-conceptual, non-intellectual. It means your mind sees emptiness directly. Not with your eyes or your ears, but your mind. So it's like a mental seeing direct seeing of emptiness. That's the main kind of realization one needs to achieve 
to progress along the path. So when you're doing that, or when you're in that kind of state of meditation and, and directly seeing emptiness, it's said that everything else disappears. So your body, all other, you know, your mind, all other beings, the world, everything just disappears. It's, it's just the mind single-pointedly focused on emptiness. And the bodhisattva needs to go into that state of, you know, experiencing emptiness directly again and again and again and again. So when you're doing that, when you're, you know, especially in that direct realization of emptiness, you can't be out in the world helping sentient beings <laughs> at the same time. It's just not possible. So that's why you have to sort of go back and forth. Sometimes you're in meditation on emptiness, and other times you get up and you, you know, go out and help sentient beings. So you alternate <coughs> back and forth. Your practice of method and wisdom can't be together simultaneously at the same time. But of course, if you do have a realization of emptiness, then even when you're not meditating, you're out in the world help helping others, or doing whatever you're doing, it's definitely going to affect you. You're not going to see things in the same way as normal. Right? So you don't have as much grasping at things. But they say it's not possible for an ordinary being to experience emptiness and be doing other things at the same time, being dealing, dealing with conventional reality at the same time. So you have to alternate back and forth. However, in Vajrayana or Tantra, uh, when you're doing this kind of practice, uh, you are able to have these two, method and wisdom, together at the same time in one consciousness. How? <laughs> um, in, the, in the practice of deity yoga, okay, so deity yoga, just briefly, um, like I said, when you're doing tantric practice, there's a sadhana um, that you do. It's a sort of meditation practice. And um, that, like I said, at one point you, you meditate on emptiness and you imagine your ordinary view of everything, yourself and others and the world and so on. Everything dissolves into emptiness. Then after that, arising from this wisdom realizing emptiness, is the deity. There's always a deity. Whenever you do tantric practice, there's always a deity. And the deity could be, for example, this is Manjushri, and deity. deity. This is the word that's used. It's, or you could say Buddha figure. Okay. So in Tibetan, Tibetan Buddhism, there's many, many different um, deities, different Buddha figures. Yeah, I mean, some of the more common, popular ones are Chanmezik, Tara, Vajrasattva, huh? Medicine Buddha, um, Vajrasattva. There's hundreds or maybe thousands of these different deities, so many. So when you do tantric practice, there's a deity involved. And when you're initiated, you've received an initiation, so you're fully qualified to do tantric practice, you visualize yourself as this deity. Okay? And this needs to be done on the basis of an understanding of emptiness, understanding there's no inherently existing I, me, myself, okay? my body, my mind, everything else. All of these things don't exist inherently. So you're able to let go of or dissolve your ordinary sense of self or I, which, uh, you know, we tend to see ourselves as very limited. You know, even if we have a big ego, we're very proud and arrogant, but we also, you know, tend to think, oh, I'm just this deluded, imperfect, sentient being, and I have all these faults, and I have all this bad karma, and I have all these problems, and so on and so forth. So we... Our view of ourself is, uh, is quite limited, quite 
low low quality. <laughs> you know, we share some of this low quality. But you know, as you've probably heard, um, Buddhism says that this isn't who we really are. This isn't our real nature. We're not going to be like this forever and ever and ever. We have the potential to transform ourselves and become a Buddha, become fully enlightened, just like the Buddha, just like Vajrasattva, just like Tara, just like these deities. So these deities are enlightened beings, or, yeah, they're like manifestations of enlightened minds, showing us what we can do, what we can achieve, how we can become. So this is part of the practice of Tantra, is you visualize yourself in the form of this deity, and um, and then identify, this is me, this is who I really am. And um, so within this practice, you ideally, you combine method and wisdom, because the wisdom part is the understanding of emptiness. Okay, So you need to do this on the understanding of emptiness. And then the method part in Tantra is the appearance of this deity, this divine body, which represents enlightened mind. The whole reason for this appearance, this body coming into existence, is to benefit sentient beings. It's a manifestation of bodhicitta, compassion, love, generosity, the wish to benefit others. And in the process of the sadhana, during you know, other parts of the sadhana, um, you know, there's places where you imagine light, you send light out from your divine body, your deity body, to all the sentient beings in the universe. And you purify their karma and their delusions and their suffering, and you help um, uh, nourish their potential for enlightenment, and then you make them, you bring all of them to the state of enlightenment as well. So this is the method side in Tantra doing this kind of practice, visualizing yourself as a deity and then sending out light and helping all sentient beings. So ideally, when you're doing this practice, I, I say ideally because it's not easy to do, <laughs> but ideally, if you're doing it right, you're combining the wisdom realizing emptiness and the method side of the path, the compassion, the love, the bodhicitta, the working for the benefit of other sentient beings. So they say it's possible to do this, to have both method and wisdom simultaneously in one mind, one consciousness. Okay, does that make sense a little bit? Yeah. So this is said to be a very special and unique feature of Tantra. And this is one of the reasons why Tantra is a quicker path. Because if you're able to practice in this way, then it's much more powerful the transformation of your mind, your mind, because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to transform this mind of ours into enlightened mind. So this kind of practice is super powerful. It's a bit like, um, you know, there's different vehicles, different ways you can travel. You can take a bicycle, you can take a car, you can take a train, you can take a plane, you can take a jet, you can take a rocket, okay? so. These different vehicles have different speeds. They travel, you know, different speeds. So, so Tantra is like a rocket, you know, it can travel faster than anything else because it's powerful. But, you know, flying a rocket, you have to be pretty, you know, trained and skilled. Not just anybody can get into the cockpit of a rocket and be able to fly it. Bicycles are easier. I have a question regarding the deities. Uh, to my understanding, each deity has his own or her set of qualities, right? Each one is um, uh, representing something of its own. For instance, uh, one is fear or fearless. One is um, I compassion. Don't know, like, uh, Shen is compassion. Fear. For instance, yeah. yeah. So how do you know which one is the best one for you? And when you practice Tantra, you take upon yourself the qualities of the deity, you become the deity with his set of 
qualities or how does it work? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I mean, sometimes it's because to get an initiation and practice tantra, you need to have you need to have a teacher. So um, sometimes it can be the teacher that will advise you. This is the practice for you. This is the one you should do. But sometimes I think I've heard you know people just they themselves feel attracted to a particular deity and feel that's the one that I want to do. And actually, even though the deities, like you say, they have different appearances, different colors and so on, and they represent different qualities, but all of them are manifestations of the same mind, enlightened mind. So in fact, they all have the same qualities. Yeah, It's not that, like Manjushri here is um, said to be the Buddha of wisdom. Chen Rezik, we don't have Chen Rezik here, but anyway, he's the Buddha of compassion. But does that mean Manjushri doesn't have compassion? Chen Rezik doesn't have wisdom? No. <laughs> They're all enlightened beings that have all enlightened qualities. <clears throat> but, yeah, for different people, perhaps, you know, some are more attracted to one or to another. And actually, I think in the Tibetan tradition, there's a tendency to practice many deities. Okay, so you can take many initiations, practice. I mean, they say it's good to really focus on one mainly do one, but you can do others as well. So, for example, the students in the monasteries, the monks in the monasteries, will probably practice Manjushri in order to increase their wisdom, because they need wisdom to be able to study and understand their, what they're studying and be able to debate and be able to you know, speak well. So the practice of Manjushri is good for that. But they also practice Tara, because Tara is good for clearing away obstacles and making things successful. They probably practice Chen Rezik as well, to have this kind heart, this warm, kind, compassionate heart. So I think most people that, in the, that I know of in the Tibetan tradition don't exclusively practice only one deity, but different deities. And, um, but even if you did only practice one, within that practice, you would probably have all the different elements that you need to become enlightened. I don't know if that's helping. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, clarification. Um, so, in Tantra, we basically assume the identity of a deity in a way that facilitates or enables <coughs> the coexistence of wisdom and method of, of emptiness and compassion. Yeah. Now, that's the ideal way to practice. Although, like I say, it's, it's difficult to be able to do that. You need, to, I mean, first of all, you need a good understanding of emptiness and you need a good, strong, genuine feeling of compassion and bodhicitta. But someone who's really qualified to practice would be doing that. They would have both of those in their mind at the same time. And ideally, you're, you're, you're doing this practice all day long. Okay, so you have times when you're sitting and doing your sadhana, but even when you don't do your sadhana, even in your daily life, you're still, you're continuing, you know, to identify yourself with your deity, with those two qualities in your mind of method and wisdom. So that's what makes it very powerful and um, enables enlightenment to happen very quickly. Does that make sense? It does. In a way, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but in a way it seems like that emptiness or mindfulness of emptiness or awareness of emptiness and compassion are both selfless. <coughs> so like, it's like they have like a common basis. Well, I mean, compassion, yeah, ideally compassion is selfless in the sense that you're focused on others rather than yourself, but it depends on one's level of development. I mean, some people might have compassion, but still, you know, still have a sense of an I, a, you know, an ego who's being compassionate, or who's hurt when others don't appreciate how compassionate you are, things like that. So, 
Sorry? Yeah, yeah. I mean, compassion can be kind of t tainted <laughs> with some other things. But yeah, if a bodhisattva, who's, especially someone who's realized emptiness, so their compassion would be, would be, you know, without an ego, without a self. So that's what we're working towards. That's the ideal: is to have really pure and genuine, selfless compassion. But there's all different levels, you know. So in the beginning, of course, we're not going to be able to practice in such a perfect way. But that's, you know, I'm talking about the ideal, the ideal uh, situation. Does strong man has more things in a way? The wisdom that is not self, and the possibility to take the suffering, and the compassion of wanting to help others? Are you asking, does Tong Len have both compassion? Oh, I see. Well, it depends on what you mean by simultaneous, because even the like Bodhisattva, who's on the Paramitayana, not the Tantrayana path, they, their mind can switch back and forth. Quickly, yeah. The mind can change very, very quickly. So they say in the Paramitayana, yeah, you can, your mind can switch from one to the other quite quickly, but not there just doesn't exist methods, practices, for being able to have both simultaneously at the same time with one mind, one consciousness. I mean, this is what they say. This is, you know, the traditional explanation. It's only in Tantra that you have practices where you can have both simultaneously in the same mind. Usually it's said we shouldn't be in a hurry to, uh, you know, grab on to <laughs> the first teacher we, we come across because, yeah, first of all, we have to be ready. So, you know, we have to feel I'm ready to have a teacher, I'm ready to start following a teacher, but we also have to make sure that the teacher we, we choose does have the right qualities. Yeah, so they say... Also, uh, I'm aware of these qualities. I'm talking about actually finding a teacher, like physically. Like, uh, what do you mean? Because, like I said, in here it's quite limited. The number yeah. of teachers, the the traditions. It's like, I because I'm I'm aware a little bit of um, of, uh, of the teachings about the qualities of a teacher and how finding it. You know, how recognizing a teacher uh, based on these qualities. Well. Different ways. <laughs> um, some people travel. If there aren't many teachers coming to the country where you're living in, you can travel to other countries uh, to find teachers. Um, but then, again, there's so many teachers, and they're here and there, and which one do I choose? So it's, it's a little difficult. I mean... Um, I don't like to tell people, you know, go to this teacher. I like that teacher, but maybe that teacher isn't right for that person. So I'm, I'm hesitant to sort of, you know... I mean, if someone came to me personally and said, can you recommend a teacher, I would do that. But in a group like this, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel comfortable to do that. I think each person needs to follow their heart, follow their intuition, and, um, you know, hopefully <laughs> find their way to the teacher that is, that is suited for them. And it's also not that you, you have to limit yourself to only one teacher. You know, you can have more than one teacher. I've had many teachers. <laughs> um, so it's partly, you know, getting in touch with your heart, your intuition, your feelings, your needs, you know, what, what feels right to you. Partly checking out different teachers, those either, either those who come here to Israel or those you can meet other places in the world. And um, sometimes it may happen by recommendation. Somebody that you know and trust will talk about their teacher and uh, recommend their teacher. And then you might go and check them out. You might feel, yes, I like this teacher, or no, they're not for me. So it's kind of a... It's not a, you know, step-by-step -step process that's the same for everybody. 
for everybody it's different. So it's hard for me to say, you know what I'm saying? But it's good to at least have the thought in your mind, I wish to find a teacher and have that, you know, a genuine, sincere motivation, you know. Not because you, you know, you just want a friend or a therapist or something like that, you know. <laughs> Ideally, you should have the right motivation. Why do I want a teacher? You know, what is it I want to achieve? So in the Buddhist tradition, it's because you want to achieve either nirvana, you want to get out of samsara, or you want to get to enlightenment. So you're looking for a teacher who will help you, guide you um, to one of those goals. So it's also important to make sure your motivation is correct. And I think, you know, you could also just make prayers or just generate this aspiration, you know, may I have a teacher, may I find a teacher, but not to do it in a sort of desperate way, you know, sometimes people get kind of desperate, you know, and, oh, when will I find my teacher, oh, I can't find my teacher, you know, so it should be a certain amount of striving and yearning to find a teacher, but at the same time done in a relaxed way, like when the time is right, it will happen. So, I don't know if that's helpful, but just so. Um, but even after meeting a teacher, even if you find somebody and you feel, wow, I like this teacher, I, I, I'd like to take this person as my teacher, you say, you should still check. You should still spend at least a couple of years getting to know that person because, <coughs> you know, sometimes people may be very charismatic, very attractive and charismatic and be able to speak very well, and you're sort of impressed with those qualities, but that's not enough to make someone a good teacher. You need to still make sure that they have these other qualities like ethics, their ethical behavior is really good, their motivation for teaching is really good, and so on. So they say spend at least a couple of years getting to know that person, checking them, spying on them. No. <laughs> no, but they do say, you know, not just when the teacher is sitting on the, the teacher's seat teaching, you know, but at other times as well. See how this person behaves when they're in the kitchen and the bathroom and the dining room and the, not the bathroom, but, you know, <laughs> and, uh, in the supermarket, you know, at other times in other situations. Just see how they behave to see if there's consistency there. So if the if it is, if the person is a gen, does genuinely have the right qualities and is a good match for you, you know, like you have to feel I can get along with this person, um, then that will just become more clear over time. So it's kind of a, a process, um, ongoing process, not just like suddenly it will happen like that. So let's take a break. Ten minutes is that okay? Because we're gonna. Be